Okay, everybody's time is valuable, so let's let's begin. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Gerson, uh, and I'm um, privileged to be welcoming uh, participants on this call and our speakers on behalf of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, uh, and the International Peace Bureau, and the Massachusetts uh, Peace Action, all of which I, I, I work quite closely with. Uh, I want to appreciate the willingness uh, of our speakers uh, to be speaking today, uh, despite what I know are a very serious differences among them and the challenges that we face in, in, this, in this time. This webinar was initially conceived and our speakers committed to join before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when there remained hope that diplomacy and popular actions could prevent a war and lead to negotiations that would honor commitments made in, in the early 1990s. Uh, those commitments were rooted uh, in the OSCE commitments that no state would seek to ensure its security at the expense of other nations' security, and the expectation that NATO would not be expanding to Russia's border. Weeks ago, there was the possibility that declaring a moratorium on new NATO memberships, building on the Minsk agreements to create a neutral and federated Ukrainian state, and negotiations for a new European security architecture could resolve the increasingly dangerous tensions. Now we face an increasingly brutal and destructive war. Hundreds have already been killed, thousands wounded, nearly a million have fled the country as, uh, as refugees, cities are being destroyed, and we face the prospect of urban warfare. There are the continuing dangers of incidents or miscalculations triggering an absolutely catastrophic US-NATO versus Russia war. And we face a new and extremely cold war that could become a new ice age. The war is a tragedy also for future generations. We need to think about this. Uh, it's the cooperation yes. that is essential to stanching uh, climate change is beginning to move beyond reach. Today's sponsoring organizations have called for an immediate ceasefire, the withdrawal of troops and diplomacy. But as someone remarked in another conversation yesterday, we are not here to debate how the ox fell in the ditch. Our sponsoring organizations and speakers have done that in other fora. Every war ends with diplomacy, and our task is to contribute to figuring out how to lift that ox from the ditch. Now, as we have seen here in the West, there are a number of visions about how this war might end if we can prevent it from escalating to a wider and still more dangerous war. Uh, an ostensible Russian victory, uh, followed by years of deadly and destabilizing insurrectionary uh, warfare, uh, so-called dirty compromise uh, with Ukraine's borders again being drawn, uh, in, in, in who knows what way, uh, and at the very least, giving Russia uh, the Donbass and a quarter down to Odessa on the Black Sea in exchange for broader troop withdrawals and reduction of sanctions. I'm sure that other possibilities would be raised in today's sessions. In these circumstances, one of our responsibilities is simply to keep lines of communication open and to keep exploring what can be done to, to stop the killing and build the peace. Um, uh, in, our, in our session, uh, our speakers will be focusing on three questions. How the killing can be halted and some semblance of stability restored. What the future of US, Russian and Euro European diplomacy looks like and how we might get there. Given the escalating war, finding answers to these questions and getting back to, common security, to a common security diplomacy agenda, the one identified before the war is urgently required. Before turning to introduce our speakers, let me say that each speaker will have between 12 and 15 minutes to make their comments. This will be followed by our question and answer period. To post your question, please use the Q&A button at the center uh, in the bottom of your screen. I'll do my very best to ask as many of the, those questions as we can get to, and certainly a, a representative sampling. Let me then introduce our speakers in the order that they will be speaking. Tarja Kronberg, is a distinguished associate fellow uh, with, uh, the, with CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Reach Institute's European Security Program. She has a long record of activities as an academic in security and peace studies, and also as a politician in foreign and security policy. Her special focus is on nonproliferation and nuclear disarmament. Most recently, as a member of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee and Subcommittee on Security and Defense, Tarja uh, worked with, with the Iran nuclear issue as the chair of, of the EP's delegation uh, for relations with Iran. In December, 2013, 
she led the first official delegation in six years um, of the EP to, to Iran. And her most recent book is Renegotiating the Nuclear Order. Alexei Gromyko is director of the Institute of Europe and a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow. He is a professor uh, uh, at the Russian Academy of Sciences. He is an associate researcher at Ruskin College and an associate visitor at St. Uh, Anthony's College at, at, at Oxford. Uh, Dr. Grimiko is president of the Russian Association of European Studies and of the Andrew Grimiko Association of Foreign Policy Studies. He is a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, Russian International Affairs Council, a member of the Research Council for the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia. He is also a member of the Research Council at the Russian Security Council Diploma Councils, uh, and uh, among other things, Editor-in-Chief of uh, the journal Contemporary Europe. Uh, Daryl Kimball has for more than two decades uh, led the Arms Control Association as the organization's education, research, and policy advocacy uh, campaigns uh, on a range of issues. These have included cancellation of the uh, new nuclear weapons programs, negotiation and ratification of the 2010 New START Agreement, opposition to the controversial U.S.-India Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, uh, the conclusion of the 2015 uh, P5 plus one JCPO, uh, JCPOA nuclear deal with Iran, uh, efforts to promote entry into force of the comprehensive test ban, uh, uh, to strengthen the uh, implementation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, and to uh, reinforce the taboo against the use of chemical weapons. Uh, Daryl is a frequent uh, expert source for reporters and policymakers. I saw him on television yesterday. Uh, and he has written and spoken extensively about nuclear arms control, disarmament, uh, non-proliferation, uh, and the effects of nuclear weapons production, testing, and use. In 2011, the McCarthy Foundation recognized the Arms Control Association as an exceptional organization uh, that effectively addresses pressing national and international challenges. Uh, that certainly qualifies for where we are today. So with that, I'm going to give the floor to Talia, and thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you, Joseph, and, and thanks for inviting me. I will concentrate on your second question, on the question of uh, diplomacy and, and particularly the European diplomacy, and, and leave the other two questions more to be answered in, in passing. I think for the Europeans, it was a shock to, to suddenly be in the middle, middle of a war in Europe again. After 70 years of social and cultural relations, in a community that suddenly wakes up to tanks and in the neighborhood and a confrontation with Russia. And I think this confrontation is, is if it is of course about Ukraine, but it is also, and maybe mostly about European security architecture, the relationship between NATO and the other countries, the EU and NATO and so forth. And I would like to begin with uh, uh, short uh, note on my work as a regional manager in the North Karelia on the Finnish-Russian border in 2000. I organized a seminar where the only question was where does Europe end and where are European borders? And the question was about is it the EU external border, is it the Urals, the geographic border, or even the Russian border in, in the Far East? And it was interesting that there was one high official from the EU who actually said that if you want to understand and um, understand uh, European borders, you have to watch Ukraine. And I think now we are really watching Ukraine. Everybody is and, and, and it is here that we see some of the new borders being drawn. After the Cold War, there was in Europe an opening which I would like to refer to, it was called the Europe without divides. I worked together with other people in the European external border, the Finnish Russian border, with cross border activities, with soft borders, with regional cooperation, what, what we call the regional communities across the border. We established the Euro, Euro, Euro area, Karelia and, and, and so forth. And, and this was also funded by Interreg and Tassis. And uh, 
the idea was common security. How do we understand each other? How do we work together? How do we have a continuous dialogue? And what happened two days ago? No one, nobody can meet anymore. No persons are allowed to go across the border. There are no meetings anymore. What happened every day is now uh, cut out. And maybe the sort of the outside indicator of what's happening is that the Finnish alcohol monopoly, Alco, has just removed Russian vodka from its shelves. So it's maybe the ultimate. So many things are changing overnight. Some experts claim that everything is changing. And I would like to start with my own country, refer to Germany and, and then the European Union as a whole, what is actually changing? A month ago, there was a gallop in, in Finland about interest in NATO membership. And 25, 28% of the Finns were interested in membership while the majority over 50% did not uh, consider NATO membership for Finland. Two days ago, the first day of, of the Ukrainian uh, attack, uh, there was a new uh, gallop, which turns out that today, the majority of Finns, 43, 53% would like to join NATO and 28% only are against. So the uh, numbers have actually turned in the opposite. And I think if you, if you think that uh, uh, the idea of, of the Russian attack is to limit, limit the impact of NATO on the Russian, Russian borders, this is of course not a very good result. Another example is the Chancellor of Germany in a recent, a recent speech made a radical change of, of, in Germany's defense posture. A country that had been opposed to militarization given its experience from the war, he tripled the uh, German defense budget in just a few moments. And, and as a third example, in the EU, there's a common position say, saying that you don't transfer weapons to, uh, to countries in war. And, and that this is uh, signed by all the European member states. And today, most states are actually transferring weapons to Ukraine, Finland and Germany, among them, which have been the most reluctant. So the conclusion, my first conclusion is that Europe is being militarized overnight. And the question is, how does this affect the way forward? And what is the role of the civil society? So here, I think the primary role in, in order to counter militarism would be to push for content, concepts like common security, soft borders, the kind of cross-border activities we were carrying on, on the Finnish-Russian border. And, <clears throat> and uh, common security in effect is the incarnation of Europe also of its membership states after the world building, and building on steel and coal union, a dialogue and common understanding emerged, creating the foundations for security based on economic social and cultural ties. So in my view, the current debate, and I think this is uh, a rose to Joseph and his colleagues who are working with the Olof Palme defined common security and, and actually taking tapas, countering the militarization that's today taking place. My second question is about the sex security architecture of Europe, or rather the security architecture in this case of, of the EU. Since there's um, great changes coming and the uh, EU is in a way at crossroads. The e express goal for EU security is to become an international security provider, whatever this means and what kind of security provider, how does the conflict of Ukraine affect these policy choices. In 2016, EU approved a common uh, global strategy, which was based on strategic autonomy for Europe. And this is, of course, a very debated issue. And, and, and most uh, critics maintain that the EU cannot just assume it can not rely on the US anymore. 
so the autonomy is, is maybe not the first thing to achieve. And um, I think this has been taken seriously in the EU. And today the EU is, is developing a security compass or maybe the strategic autonomy has moved into strategic stability. And um, in a way, the Europeans will continue to depend on the US. You can see also that the sanctions that were accepted by the US and, and um, uh, Europe in, in coordination as opposed to uh, situations before. So this is maybe an accept that uh, the European security will depend on NATO in the future. And this is all the more in an age of Russian aggression. So actually the original plan was that in March, this month, the um, European member states would accept the strategic compass, which would sort of cement the foundations for shared vision for EU security and defense among the member states. The process was in, initiated a couple of years ago. There have been threat analysis carried out, also dialogues among member states, and, and the compass is almost ready. And it, it's goals are to operationalize the EU strategic autonomy to better link EU strategic operational capability needs. Actually, a question of, of self-interest self and, and militarization. After the Ukrainian war, this compass has to be put on ice, at least for some time. It has to be reviewed in new light, both regular regarding the level of militarization, but also in relation to common security. There's not very much common security in the strategic compass. It's most, mostly an expression of self-interest. <coughs> it even disregards the EU's own experience in creating security community of peace for decades. In the current debates, it's also interesting to note the uh, divide, while the West maintains that state, a state is free to cho choose its alliances, the Russian claim is that the country should not choose a security architecture that reduces the security of another state. I think All right, Talia, I hate to interrupt, but as you requested, you have about three minutes. Okay, that's fine. I would like to, my third point is about the nuclear issue. The fact that um, Russia has um, uh, threatened with nuclear uh, weapons and that the uh, status of, of the weapons has been elevated. And so the question is, what should be the European answer? This is my last question on the European diplomacy. What should be the European answer to these nuclear threats? The European Union doesn't have a nuclear posture, posture and, and it has had a very difficult time in, in creating one because of some countries are non-nuclear, others are nuclear. And I think the ban treaty, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons has actually aggravated the situation in the sense that France is one of the countries that are most active in, in uh, rejecting the ban treaty and Austria is the most active same state in promoting this ban treaty. So this will pose the most urgent problem for nuclear diplomacy right now. How can we define what the European Union actually means about the nuclear threats? And the final comment is about the um, fact that uh, Ukraine has applied or is applying for European membership, uh, men, uh, membership European Union membership. And the question I would like to pose, and I think the discussion hopefully will, will show some uh, indicators, will this um, halt the fighting if, if uh, Ukraine becomes a member of the European Union, or would it actually be a case where uh, the Russian aggression would just be increased? Another question is, of course, whether the EU would be able to accept the state that is in war. So I hope this will be up in the discussion and what will be the effects of potentially of the Euro, Euro, uh, Ukrainian application. Thank you so much. Thank you, Talia. That was uh, very helpful. And I think certainly for people here in the United States, uh, a lot that was new there. 
Uh, let me now turn and give Alexei the floor. Alexei, it is yours. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, let me start with uh, the first question, what should be done right now? And then uh, uh, I will proceed to explaining my views on uh, the background of the conflict uh, and the reasons uh, behind it. Uh, these days, uh, well, these weeks, days and uh, hours, uh, quite a significant uh, group of Russian, European and uh, American specialists uh, is working on uh, a statement uh, dedicated uh, to the end of uh, uh, hostilities and to uh, a peace uh, process in uh, Ukraine and in Donbas. Um, let me briefly share with you my uh, own views uh, on how it uh, can be done. Um, well, uh, first of all, as soon as possible, Russia and Ukraine should reach agreement on a ceasefire. Uh, and uh, also they should uh, cooperate on uh, humanitarian uh, aspects of the, co of the conflict. Uh, second, when uh, this is done, uh, any shipments of armaments to the, co to the conflict zone uh, should be stopped. Um, my third point, Russia and NATO, Russia and the United States should resume uh, as soon as possible, military to military communication to uh, avoid unintended uh, in, uh, incidents. Now, point four is that uh, the talks between Russia and Ukraine should continue to develop a, a political dialogue on uh, conditions of the peace settlement. Uh, point five, uh, the warring sides should, uh, should initiate uh, international talks on the military uh, neutrality of Ukraine, uh, supported by multilateral international uh, guarantees. Uh, and uh, my sixth point would be that in the context of the uh, above me uh, measures, uh, Russia and NATO, Russia and the United States should resume talks on uh, uh, some key aspects of European security, uh, arms control and uh, confidence building uh, me uh, measures. And uh, of course, this should include, first of all, the moratorium on the INF. Um, also, it should include uh, doctrinal uh, issues like the indivisibility of security, like uh, INCSI and dangerous military activities agreements. And uh, uh, by the way, I would like to point out that the status of the Russian nuclear weapons uh, uh, has not been uh, raised. Um, uh, technically, uh, what was done uh, has nothing to do with, with the status of the nuclear uh, weapons, but uh, uh, it, deals, uh, it deals with, uh, um, with uh, uh, some uh, aspects uh, of uh, how uh, many people uh, are uh, 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 looking, you know, for um, a certain um, uh, schedule, which uh, may be used in case uh, if uh, uh, the level, uh, the uh, level of uh, threats for uh, Russia uh, raises. But it has nothing to do with uh, with uh, with the weapons uh, per se. Uh, and now, um, some of my thoughts on uh, on the background of the uh, conflict. Uh, well, uh, Russia experienced several strategic shocks a long time ago. Uh, from my point of view, the first time it uh, happened in 1999 when Yugoslavia was bombed by NATO and then a Kosovo pre president uh, took place. The second shock uh, uh, came in 2003, when the United States, uh, the UK and other countries uh, attacked uh, Iraq uh, under false reasons. Um, the third shock happened in 2008, uh, when NATO uh, membership uh, aspirations 
led, led uh, Saakashvili to attack South uh, Ossetia. Um, in its recent talks with Russia, the West made uh, Ukraine uh, a key element of the whole negotiation structure. Russia tries to oppose it and to make this issue a subordinate one to the, require, to the requirements on uh, security uh, guarantees. Uh, but uh, ultimately, the Ukrainian crisis did become the core of the hostilities. Um, and just to remind us that for six years, Moscow was in fact the main vehicle uh, behind Minsk II agreements. And uh, if uh, implemented, it would have uh, reinstated Donbas as an integral part of uh, uh, the country. Um, unfortunately, the intractability of the NATO expansion uh, problem wedded to the Ukrainian uh, crisis and a range of statements, some of them reckless ones, uh, including uh, during the last uh, Munich security uh, conference, put an end to Minsk II. And this led to the radical and dramatic decisions in uh, Moscow. Um, I think that the further ramifications are still uh, uh, unknown. Uh, as unknown are um, tactics and strategy of the United States and NATO towards these uh, ramifications. Uh, for example, uh, to help to resolve the crisis or to uh, prolong it, to try to inflict a maximum uh, damage to Russia, but at the same time, uh, a collateral damage to Ukraine. Um, now, uh, there is an extremely high level of escalation and, uh, and a possibility of a direct clash between Russia and uh, NATO. And uh, also, well, unique is a decision of the European Union, the first time in its uh, history, to send lethal weapons, including mi uh, well, military heavy uh, weaponry, to a conflict zone. Uh, and not just to a conflict zone, but uh, uh, the conflict where Russia is one of the fighting sites. Um, but uh, at the same time, there are different uh, conflicting signals. For example, the, the other day, uh, there, was a f there was a statement from Washington that the United States and, and Russia may work on a mechanism of uh, the confliction in uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, also, let me remind us that in days prior to the recognition, on the, uh, on the 22nd of February, um, the separatist republics, their uh, territory uh, was shelled heavily. And this is clearly demonstrated by the daily maps of the OSCE monitoring uh, missions. And especially if you look at the maps from the um, 17th to the 21st of uh, February, they speak uh, volume. And uh, of course the fire was returned. Uh, and by the way, all uh, past days, uh, especially Donetsk has been heavily um, uh, bombed. Um, unfortunately, the option of uh, the last push, um, I mean a putative uh, Lavrov Blinken meeting and then a possible new Russian, the US uh, summit, which Macron was trying to uh, arrange, was not taken by the Russian uh, government. And of course, the recognition, not to mention the military uh, operation in wider Ukraine was and is a big risk with several uh, unknowns. But uh, the Kremlin is uh, uh, adamant that the risks to Russia's national security are much greater if Ukraine is not barred forever from NATO, it is not demilitarized and expansion of NATO is not stopped completely in Eastern, uh, in Eastern uh, direction. And from my point of view, to some, extent, uh, until recently, we had on our hands uh, 
well, a new Cuban uh, crisis in the making, but this time a Cuban crisis in reverse. In other words, uh, the perception of the existential threat on the borders of Russia, not uh, on the borders of the United States, uh, as it was in 1962. And there is a view uh, that Moscow decided to act uh, military uh, precisely in order to preclude such, such chain of uh, uh, events from developing rather than wait uh, until a military clash is guaranteed, not only between Russia and uh, um, Ukraine, but between Russia and, Na and uh, NATO. Uh, well, in a situation like this, uh, uh, this is my view, it is uh, almost certain that no amount of sanctions against uh, uh, Russia will play any uh, role in changing its foreign uh, and security uh, policy. Uh, there is the opinion poll from the 27th of uh, February. It shows that 68% uh, of the population supports the uh, campaign and, the, and a significant number, 22%, uh, um, oppose it. And by the way, uh, only 6% uh, support a, re a regime change in Ukraine and only 4% uh, support uh, as separation of Ukraine. So these uh, percents are meager. Uh, well, uh, uh, just to uh, summarize, uh, recently the first round of talks between Russia and Ukraine took place in uh, Belarus, and it is possible that uh, tonight a second meeting will take place and yesterday uh, several important uh, statements were made uh, in uh, Moscow by the Kremlin. Uh, I would point out to a statement that uh, Zelensky is a legitimate president of, of Ukraine. Um, uh, and one more statement that Ukraine is a separate country which independently organized its own presidential election. And uh, one more statement by Sergei uh, Shoigu, he pointed out that the defense of Russia, uh, I am citing, uh, the defense of Russia uh, against a threat from the West is a key task of the whole special operation in uh, uh, Ukraine, the end of quote. So my take is that uh, uh, this is well a reminder that Moscow looks at the current uh, events in Ukraine in a broader European uh, context. So uh, hopefully uh, tonight, a second round of talks between Russia and Ukraine will take uh, place and, ho and hopefully it will bring us closer to, uh, to uh, a more ceasefire and, uh, and to a peace settlement. Thank you. Alexei, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it's very helpful for uh, people here to have the perspective from, from Moscow. I hadn't wanted to talk too much about how the ox got into the ditch. Uh, and my hope is certainly that, that the ceasefire uh, will, will come soon uh, in, in, in the course of ongoing negotiations. Uh, but, but thank you very much. And, um, and we'll go more deeply when we get to the Q&A session. I want to give the floor now to, to Daryl Kimball, uh, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joe, uh, and to our previous two speakers. Uh, thank you for organizing uh, this uh, exchange at this um, very sad and difficult and, and dangerous time. Uh, it is uh, tragic that President Putin has chosen the path of destruction instead of diplomacy. Um, you know, as we speak at the moment, we need to remember that Russian guns, rockets, and missiles are pummeling civilian and military targets in Kyiv, uh, Kharkiv, and elsewhere uh, in Ukraine. Uh, young soldiers, uh, men and women, Russian, Ukrainian, are fighting and dying unnecessarily. Um, so this is a very sad and difficult and dangerous time. Um, I would just I think it needs to be said, um, as many have said uh, in recent days around the world, that 
Putin's assault on uh, Ukraine is indefensible. It's clearly premeditated. Um, he has brought down international condemnation and economic deprivation on his country uh, for uh, a good time to come. We have yet to see uh, how the, the sanctions uh, will um, affect uh, Russia's economy. We are in the early days and hours. Uh, what's also clear is that uh, Putin and the Russian government are trying to quash dissent and opposition to his war inside of Russia. Uh, but there are some signs that uh, he does not have the support of the Russian people. And it's increasingly clear to me that many of Russia's senior foreign policy experts and leaders uh, recognize uh, the errors here and the blunder that President Putin has, has committed, um, which is why many are uh, of us are calling for uh, an immediate ceasefire, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, now, I don't want to go into the, the issues and the debate about how we got here. Um, you know, clearly, there are many grievances uh, that are fueling President Putin's um, uh, attempt to reset the post-Cold War uh, European security order through military force. Some of these are real, some may be legitimate. Uh, such as the history uh, and the debate about NATO expansion and its effect on the military balance in Europe. Uh, other uh, reasons uh, that President Putin has cited are clearly uh, imagined uh, and fictional, uh, such as uh, his charge that Ukraine uh, may be pursuing nuclear weapons, a charge that the IAEA director, uh, Rafael Mariano Grossi, just this morning um, refuted and said uh, there was no basis uh, for such a charge. So no rationale um, justifies uh, this violent attack by Russia on one of its neighbors. Um, uh, Putin uh, bypassed the diplomatic option um, that apparently was there uh, and chose uh, this much more Dangerous path. So, as as Alexei said, uh, we do not know how this nightmare of a war will end. Uh, this is a, a dangerous moment. Um, the lives of thousands of people at risk, millions of refugees are on the move. Uh, this is how I would characterize the uh, present um, actions um, and intentions uh, of of each of the key players here in a moment, and then I'm going to get to some ideas about uh, what must be done. Uh, you know, as, as Tarja mentioned, uh, Putin has tried to warn off NATO and US intervention in the Russian attack on Ukraine through crude and dangerous nuclear saber rattling, uh, raising um, the alert levels of Russia's strategic forces. Um, I think this is mainly political signaling, not a major change in the actual uh, alert levels so much of Russia's forces, which are all always on high alert. Uh, but this heightens the risks of miscalculation and catastrophe. And thankfully, President Biden has wisely not matched uh, Putin's irresponsible uh, statements about, about nuclear weapons, and he has not raised the alert levels of U.S. nuclear forces. Um, second, what's clear, uh, and I think surprising somewhat to the Russian government, um, the besieged people of Ukraine are clearly behind their democratically elected government. Uh, they are getting, and I think deserve to get uh, urgent humanitarian assistance from the international community and also defensive military assistance uh, to try to prevent uh, Putin's army from seizing more, if not all of Ukraine's territory. Um, the other thing that's quite clear is that um, you know, not only has the United States, Europe, the international community, even Switzerland delivered strong uh, sanctions against uh, key Russian institutions and leaders, uh, but uh, this has created the very, uh, it has reinforced the very concerns that President Putin was talking about before the conflict, uh, a more united NATO, a more forward uh, NATO. We have uh, the realistic possibility now, which was sort of unthinkable just weeks ago, of additional states such as Finland and Sweden possibly uh, gaining NATO membership in the future. So rather than addressing Russia's security concerns, stated security concerns, 
uh, Putin's actions have boomeranged and, and uh, at least from what we think are Russia's concerns um, will make the, the situation uh, much different. Um, and as for Mr. Putin, um, you know, I, in the discussion, I'd be interested to hear what Alexei has to say, but it appears to me and I think many other observers that Putin right now is trying to have his army surround Kiev, surround Ukraine's ports and other cities uh, to replace President Zelensky's government uh, with some other kind of uh, regime. Uh, a regime I would, I would note uh, would clearly not have any legitimacy in the eyes of the international community or from the Ukrainian people. So without a diplomatic end to the war, we will see, unfortunately, uh, further catastrophic destruction and, and perhaps weeks of conflict and perhaps worse. So where do we go from here? Or as Vladimir Lenin might've asked, um, this is from the title of one of his books, what is to be done? Uh, so number one, uh, we must all join together and demand a ceasefire uh, because clearly lasting diplomatic solutions are not possible um, without an end to the fighting and bombardment of Russia's forces. Uh, as Alexei noted, uh, a second day of talks may be underway between Russian and Ukrainian officials. Um, I have my doubts about uh, uh, any uh, successful outcomes, um, but um, stranger things have happened. Uh, what I think is important for everybody to uh, uh, reinforce is that what is necessary uh, is an immediate unconditional ceasefire, an agreement that no additional Russian or Belarusian forces shall enter Ukrainian territory or advance Ukraine's internationally recognized borders. Uh, and as part of that, they must allow for humanitarian and medical assistance uh, within uh, the conflict zone uh, to uh, Russian and Ukrainian forces, civilian and military. Also an agreement to withdraw all Russian forces from Ukraine within an agreed short time frame and under international monitoring, probably by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE. And then an agreement uh, that the government of Russia and the government of Ukraine with the support of and facilitation of other key states will engage in negotiations to resolve outstanding disputes through political, not military solutions. Um, and, I think until and unless these and probably additional actions are taken, uh, it is uh, quite unlikely that the uh, very uh, onerous uh, regime of sanctions, financial and otherwise, that uh, are now uh, being put into motion uh, will continue and that Russia will remain uh, an international pariah state. Um, so those are, in my view, the immediate uh, steps that must be taken to uh, try to end the, the, the suffering that's going on and that will worsen in the days ahead. Um, but so long as there is fighting, it's also too essential that this does not become a wider conflict. So let me talk about a couple things that we need to emphasize and encourage to reduce the risk of escalation. Um, you know, in the days and weeks ahead, leaders in Moscow, Washington, and Europe have to be careful to avoid new and destabilizing military deployments, offensive military deployments, and especially close encounters between Russian and NATO forces. As we speak, the airspace over Ukraine is highly contested. Uh, the sea lanes uh, in the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, and elsewhere uh, are busy. Uh, there is a heightened risk of a military to military encounter uh, that leads to uh, the shoot down of an aircraft, uh, deliberate or accidental. Um, we all know about the airliner that was shot down by Russian backed forces um, in uh, several years ago uh, in the earlier conflict in Eastern Ukraine. Um, so what that means is Russia needs to agree uh, to US and NATO overtures, which have been underway to open up military to military lines of communication to avoid um, these kinds of, of accidents, which could lead to a rapid escalation of the fighting uh, beyond the current uh, conflict zone. Uh, it's also important that neither Russia nor NATO begin to or threaten to introduce new forms of offensive weapons that could threaten one another 
you know, undermine the common security. And I would cite, for example, uh, the rather egregious uh, and flagrant um, uh, offer from Russia's client state, Belarus, to host Russian tactical nuclear weapons uh, if NATO uh, were to consider the forward deployment of US tactical nuclear weapons uh, further east um, into Poland or the Baltic states, which is something that may very well be on the table after this uh, Russian uh, initiated conflict. And those kinds of steps would further other undermine Russian and European security and increase the risk of nuclear war in the future. Uh, on, let me address very briefly post-war risk reduction uh, issues here. Um, you know, Putin's regime will and must suffer international isolation now, but eventually uh, US and Russian leaders must uh, seek to resume talks uh, on these stalled strategic uh, security dialogue the US and Russia uh, were engaged in uh, just in the, the months before this conflict broke out. Um, it was designed to address the very issues that President Putin and Russia had been talking about. It was uh, an active uh, engaged forum um, that needs to be revived uh, if and, and whenever the, the fighting uh, ends. Um, Unfortunately, it's not clear to me at this point which of the many Russian concerns we should be paying the most attention to. Um, uh, and, and if we could find win-win solutions on a few of them, it's not clear which of them would uh, diffuse the, the uh, tensions and address the concerns that Russia has that might uh, fuel a future conflict. Um, you know, and I, I say that because President Putin's more recent statements uh, suggest that he's not just worried about greater European security, but he is uh, thinking about reestablishing a greater Russia uh, by uh, retaking Ukraine or putting in uh, a government that is very friendly uh, to Russia instead of an independent democratic one. So, however, if, if Russia's December 2021 proposals on security guarantees and arms control uh, are any guide, um, it, it might provide a more sober and straightforward indication of where Russia's genuine concerns might be. And if that's the case, uh, and if we look at the United States responses in January to those Russian proposals, I think there are some options for resolving mutual concerns, including agreements to scale back large military exercises, uh, to move back uh, from the, the frontier between Russia and NATO, uh, offensive strike forces that each side uh, may have or may have in the future, uh, and particularly to prevent the deployment of uh, intermediate range uh, missiles, ground launch cruise missiles and ballistic missiles in Europe or Western Russia in the absence of the INF Treaty. Um, these kinds of negotiations will be necessary uh, even after this horrible conflict ends because there will be even more severe Russia, NATO, uh, tensions. And lastly, before I finish up, um, you know, after this, this war ends, we need to remember uh, that there is an urgent nuclear arms control and disarmament agenda uh, that has been put on the back burner uh, by President Putin uh, with this, um, this deadly war. Uh, Russia and the West, uh, in fact, Russia and the world, still have a common interest in striking agreements that further slash the bloated uh, nuclear arsenals of the United States and Russia and other nuclear armed countries. As we sit here um, talking about this, uh, how to resolve this war, there's also the possibility of nuclear escalation. Uh, the United States and Russian presidents have the sole authority to launch uh, several hundred uh, nuclear weapons, probably about 800. Um, uh, that can take place within 20 minutes of a launch order. And there are several more hundred that are available for launch afterwards. Um, Carol, I hate to interrupt. And I'm, about to, I'm, about, to, I'm about to close up. And, and, and so there is an urgent agenda uh, on this front. Um, uh, and we have to remember that the last remaining agreement uh, between the two countries regulating their nuclear stockpiles, the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, will expire in early 2026 unless the two sides negotiate a new agreement or agreements. So we can't lose sight of the fact, uh, no, no matter where we are, 
uh, in Russia, the United States, Europe, elsewhere around the world that we have a common enemy and it's war and especially nuclear war and we need to work together to stop them. Thank you, thank you, Daryl. And we, we covered a lot with uh, those, those three talks. Um, uh, you know, there's some commonality. I, I have to say that, you know, I, I, I remain deeply sobered by both the ongoing war in Ukraine and the dangers of, of escalation as Alexei was talking about the possibility of a Cuban Missile Crisis in reverse. Um, pretty, uh, pretty sobering. Uh, so if people will be patient with me, uh, I'm going to go to the Q&A uh, box here. Uh, last I saw, we had about 21 questions uh, and uh, we'll see uh, what, we can, what we can do here. Um, the two questions uh, from, um, let me get it here. Um, from, from Larry, no, from um, Lonigan, let me find it here. Yeah, from Michael Lonigan. Um, one uh, was, uh, what is the name uh, and origin of the EU agreement not to send arms to the conflict zone? And I think in another one, uh, is there a diplomatic path that doesn't require regime change uh, in Kiev or Moscow? So two questions, maybe, Maybe to ask uh, Talia to ask the first, uh, and then the second will be open to everybody. Yes, the EU states have agreed to what is called common position on uh, arms uh, export. And there's nine criteria in terms of that you should not uh, send uh, uh, weapons in when a country is in war, you should not send weapons if, if there's a, a chance that the wars, uh, the weapons will be transmitted to a third country. There are very clear criteria and, and all the countries who are members of the European Union have actually approved this. So it is the guidelines for, for not increasing weapons in, in war areas, especially, and uh, this is where, for example, Finland had a, a discussion and, and just uh, the government decided that they are going to send weapons to Ukraine last night. And I think the same has happened in Germany and other countries. And it has not led to any more consultations with, for example, uh, voting or, or something in the parliament. The EU is also, like uh, Daryl was saying, is also sending some weapons to Ukraine. So this is kind of a solidarity uh, expression. Thank you for that, Talia. So Daryl or Alexei, who wants to go first? Uh, no, no. Darryl, is, go ahead, Daryl. Well, is there a diplomatic path um, to ending the war that does not involve regime change? Yes. Um, there should be. Um, there's no reason why there should be a regime change in Ukraine. Um, this is a democratically elected government. Um, I'm glad Alexei pointed out that these recent statements, I had not seen them last night from Russia, acknowledging the independence of Ukraine and the legitimacy of President uh, Zelensky. Um, I do not foresee um, regime change in Russia. Um, uh, we're dealing with the leaders who um, are there now, and um, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, let me uh, make a couple of uh, comments. Um, the first one is uh, just to pick up from what uh, was said uh, before. Uh, from my point of view, a democratic government in Ukraine does not uh, contradict a desire of Russia to have this government as uh, Russian friendly, or at least neutral in uh, uh, military terms. Um, and just to uh, remind one fact from history, that in uh, 1962, the United States were ready to start a nuclear war with the Soviet Union if a sovereign Cuba pursued its legitimate right to choose its own security architecture. 
So uh, uh, when uh, I wrote recently and uh, today uh, mentioned this option of a Cuban crisis in uh, reverse, this is uh, something uh, uh, what for Russia these days looks uh, like, you know, uh, the same uh, moment or experience which the United States uh, uh, felt or went through in 1962, uh, because if Ukraine, for example, in five, 10 or 20 years time becomes uh, a member of NATO, then uh, there is no uh, hurdles, no uh, obstacles uh, to put uh, a, a, any kind of strike systems on the Ukrainian uh, uh, soil. So uh, this is uh, something what can be discussed and uh, debated, but I do not think that such kind of things uh, can be, you know, just uh, uh, just uh, be just banished as uh, uh, something um, something uh, hypothetical or something what does not worth to uh, to pay uh, attention to. Uh, and one more point. Mm, um, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, it was uh, indeed uh, reckless for Zelensky to say uh, what he said uh, at the Munich Security uh, Conference, and that was uh, that was not a joke. And just let me um, quote him. Uh, so at Mu at Munich. Uh, from my point of view, uh, Zelensky clearly hinted at the possibility to review the non-nuclear status of Ukraine. And let me quote him, you may recheck it. Uh, so uh, I quote, since 2014, Ukraine three times has tried to call consultations of the state's uh, guarantors of the Budapest uh, Memorandum. Today, Ukraine does it for the fourth time. If the consultation again uh, does not take place or they will result in no security guarantees to our state, Ukraine will have a full right to uh, reconsider the Budapest Memorandum uh, uh, and to uh, uh, and to uh, think that it does not work and all package decisions, all package decisions taken in 1994 are in doubt, the uh, end of quote. So uh, now I am not going to uh, argue that uh, that was, you know, uh, something what uh, was impossible to uh, prevent you know, from further development, uh, but at the same time to uh, argue that uh, that was a joke uh, and that uh, there was no uh, uh, direct and clear hint that the, that the nuclear status uh, of uh, Ukraine uh, may be tried to um, uh, reconsider, uh, I would not buy it. So I'll jump in here and just for for others on the call to remind people uh, that the, the Budapest memorandum was basically an agreement uh, whereby uh, Ukraine gave up the, the nuclear weapons that had been left in Ukraine uh, by the Soviet Union following the collapse of the Soviet Union in exchange for guarantees of its uh, territorial integrity. Uh, I'm gonna jump to a question from uh, Alan Ware. Uh, it's a question directed to, uh, to Alexei and to Daryl. Uh, there are very different narratives from Russia and the West over NATO expansion, uh, the status of Crimea and the status of the Donbass region. Is this part of the conflict something that might be useful to take to the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, or the International Court of Justice, uh, either as a contentious case or possibly better as an advisory opinion? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I think that might be the, the logical thing to do. Um, but I don't think in this circumstance, um, 
the ICJ is going to be able to resolve um, uh, this issue. It is fundamentally a political issue, um, even though there are legal uh, issues here. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's not a neat and tidy um, arbitration uh, solution uh, in, my, in my opinion. Um, I, let me just very briefly, Joe, just come back. Um, I wanna take issue with Alexi's uh, characterization of the current situation as being something akin to the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis situation. Um, you know, the, Russia has clearly violated the commitments it made, security commitments it made to Ukraine in 1994 in that Budapest memorandum. Um, Zelensky's comment at the, the Munich Security Conference uh, was a reminder to the international community that Russia had violated the commitments in 2014 when it uh, took over Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea. Uh, he was warning again. Um, and it is clear, Alexei, that Ukraine you know, once had Soviet ICBMs, uh, Soviet warheads, but it does not have the capacity to produce uh, nuclear weapons indigenously uh, anytime in the coming years. Um, and Zelensky has made statements in more recent days reaffirming uh, its commitment, Ukraine's commitment to the NPT. Uh, in 1962, Russia put medium range missiles on Cuba uh, that threatened the United States. Uh, that changed the, the, the nuclear equation in very significant ways. There's no equivalent uh, today. To say that, you know, in a decade, Ukraine might join NATO and somehow become a nuclear state, uh, justifying uh, an invasion on the scale um, is, uh, I think, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a good comparison uh, to be kind. So let's, let's deal with the realities here um, and uh, about how to resolve this issue rather than to uh, try to create false equivalencies. Lexi? Well, I hold uh, different views on uh, equivalences and other things, you know, to say that uh, Ukraine in the coming year, uh, years is not uh, able to design a nuclear bomb well, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, you know, not a waterproof uh, argument. Um, the uh, thing uh, is to make sure that not in the coming years, but in the coming uh, decades, um, uh, a certain uh, country cannot become a, a nuclear one. And uh, Ukraine and even current U uh, Ukraine uh, has a huge uh, expertise in uh, nuclear uh, technologies. They've got uh, a lot of nuclear uh, reactors. Uh, they've got a lot of nuclear Alexei, waste. I was not denying that. I was talking about how long it would take a country like Ukraine to do that. Does it justify an invasion today? No. So oh, let's, yes. let's please move let's, on. Let's, let's, okay. let, me, let, me, let, me, let me intervene and each person needs to have Time to finish their their their, their, their responses without without interruption. Uh, fine. Um, okay. Then uh, the status of Crimea and the status of uh, Donbas. Well, from the Moscow's point of view, uh, the uh, issue of the status of Crimea uh, uh, is not the uh, issue which can be debated or uh, discussed. This is the uh, integral uh, territory of uh, the country. Uh, and uh, I might uh, imagine that if we uh, reach a level of multilateral set of uh, agreements, uh, which can, uh, which can uh, secure um, uh, the future of uh, Russia, Ukraine, and wider Europe, then uh, certainly uh, uh, Crimea uh, should be uh, recognized by Ukraine uh, as an uh, integral part of uh, Russia. Uh, as to uh, Donbas, well, uh, uh, Russia has uh, recognized the two republics there. Uh, if other uh, countries, uh, Ukraine or whatever country you take, 
should or should not uh, recognize them. Uh, this is uh, up to them. This is not a part of the Russian uh, territory. Uh, now their uh, security uh, uh, will be uh, provided in the near uh, future. And uh, let's not uh, forget that since 2014, uh, twice uh, Kyiv tried to uh, overrun uh, Donbas with uh, military force. There has been uh, shell, uh, shelling for seven years and uh, thousands of people are uh, killed. So this is not just a, a tragedy, uh, the uh, uh, tragedy of, uh, uh, well, of uh, Ukraine per, uh, per se, but it has been a, a tragedy of uh, uh, Donbas uh, 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 and absolutely on the equal uh, basis. And uh, Crimea, well, you know, I uh, am not sure if somebody in the West is going to reconsider the uh, status, for example, of, uh, of uh, Kosovo. And let me, and let me uh, remind us that in uh, Kosovo, they uh, even uh, didn't take care to conduct a, a referendum. Uh, not a single one in, uh, in uh, Kosovo, but its uh, independence was uh, proclaimed, but there was a referendum in uh, Crimea. So uh, I think that uh, the status of Crimea and the status of uh, Donbass are completely uh, different uh, uh, issues um, and we should treat them uh, as different and not to put them, you know, in one basket. I see that, that Talia wants to come in. Let me just say that I, I studied the Cuban Missile Crisis quite, quite closely and have written about it. And one of the things to learn, there were just a number of miscalculations uh, and uh, how, how close we came to an unintended uh, nuclear war. So I think that, you know, that, that, that should sober us. And my sense is that uh, you know, some, of the, some of the historical uh, background to this on the one hand, obviously it needs to be considered as we try to figure out diplomatic paths forward, uh, but also recognizing that some of this is going to be debated for decades to come. Uh, and and the, 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 the priority for us now uh, is I, I believe to, to uh, get to that ceasefire and to those negotiations. Talia, I wanna give you the, the floor please. So I'm mute. Just a very short comment on the Budapest memorandum since it's so decisive here. First of all, <clears throat> it was about Ukraine moving its uh, nuclear weapons to, to Russia, <coughs> signing the NPT and so forth. And three states guaranteed Ukraine's um, borders. It was Russia, uh, the UK and the US and it was a collective responsibility. And uh, Russia of course uh, was the aggressive and, and, and did change the borders. But the not changing the borders was also a responsibility for the US and the UK. And when asked about this, both countries said that the guarantees that were given in the, in the, in the Budapest Medoman memorandum were not legal. They were not uh, legal enough and, and that Ukraine actually had been deceived in a sense. And I don't want to continue this discussion, but just to say that this is one, the fate of the Budapest Memorandum is one of the things that actually undermines the credibility of nuclear disarmament in the sense that there are guarantees which are not legal, they can be taken back retroactively and no one seems to care. Thank you. So uh, I wanna actually direct the next question to, to Talia um, with a, with a um, a sense of humility here about the whiteness of, of all of us uh, in, uh, who are speaking here. Uh, but a, a question from Ayman Fadel. Uh, other than the threat of global nuclear catastrophe brought on by this conflict among Europeans, what lessons should non-European peoples of the world draw? Well, uh, yes. I think, first of all, uh, one of the things that the Europeans have been facing here is a threat of nuclear weapons. And I think all countries should face the, the, the fact that nuclear weapons can be used as threats, 
hopefully they will not be used as weapons, but there's always, always the threat of, of a nuclear weapon use potentially. It's sort of built into the idea of deterrence in, in, in the nuclear order. So, so you can never be sure. And as long as any country, we have nine countries in the world that today have nuclear weapons. So reducing and eliminating these weapons, and now we have also a, a UN treaty that actually prohibits uh, uh, nuclear weapons. So in this case, I think the best way is to eliminate nuclear weapons. The threat will always be there for anyone. Alexi or Daryl, do you want to comment? Well, let me just make a quick comment. Uh, I think we saw several people, uh, several representatives uh, in the Security Council debate uh, before uh, Russia's um, incursion into Ukraine began, uh, make the point that for states outside of Europe, uh, uh, you know, Russia's rationale for um, these actions um, are reminiscent of the uh, colonial uh, mentality that um, many of those countries have experienced. Uh, the Kenyan representative mentioned that um, countries in Africa have learned uh, not to uh, try to redefine the arbitrary borders that were established by the colonial powers um, decades ago. Uh, and to uh, try to align it so that it is more uh, favorable to certain uh, racial or ethnic groupings. Um, so, you know, I think that's one other um, lesson that other countries around the world are drawing. And one other reason why they are uh, offended by um, what is happening um, in this conflict. Do you want to comment? Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, very shortly, uh, you know, uh, all the discussions on the Budapest uh, memorandum are very uh, complex one. When you try to make them simple, this uh, does not work. You know, and specialists know that the Budapest uh, memorandum was not ratified, that it was not a legally binding uh, guarantee uh, and uh, uh, I think a very important point that uh, Russia uh, considers the change of power in Kyiv in February 2014 uh, as a coup d'etat. The legitimacy of the uh, government of the state was uh, undermined. So there are a lot of things which uh, can be uh, disputed and I do not think that we should uh, pretend that uh, this is black and white uh, situation. Uh, I think that uh, 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 other regions and uh, countries which are not uh, situated in uh, Europe, for example, can draw a, a conclusion from what is going on here that, uh, that a legitimate um, national uh, interests uh, in the sphere of security should not be uh, neglected. Uh, if uh, a certain country for 30 years uh, is saying from year to year that uh, an expansion of a certain military bloc uh, threatens its national fundamental uh, uh, security interests, uh, somebody should listen. Um, and, uh, you know, there are hundreds of documents, they are uh, available, they are declassified. How starting from 1990, uh, this, uh, uh, quite a few people in the Soviet leadership and then uh, uh, even Kozarev and Yeltsin were trying uh, once and again to stop the uh, expansion of uh, uh, NATO. Uh, this is not the justification of, of uh, whatever is being done, but uh, we should uh, we should know uh, the history, and uh, uh, we should uh, we we should know that what is going on this day uh, is not just uh, from the blue. 
but uh, it is rooted uh, in uh, you know years and uh, decades when certain uh, uh, fundamental and uh, undercurrent uh, re uh, reasons um, were uh, evolving. And uh, one more thing um, on the uh, colonial struggle and uh, uh, anti colonial colonialism. Let me uh, remind us that the Soviet U uh, Union, uh, in fact, was the main supporter of the anti colonial uh, struggle in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, when uh, the, the West was calling Nelson Mandela uh, a terrorist. For example, Margaret Thatcher was fond of calling Nelson Mandela a terrorist. <laughs> the uh, Soviet uh, Union treated him uh, as <laughs> a friend. Um, so I uh, do not think that uh, you know we should uh, embed now in uh, uh, in the minds of millions of people. Uh, we should not now you know uh, put our stakes on a, a narrative that uh, uh, Russia acts uh, as a, a colonial power. By the way, uh, there, there is a clear uh, position the, these days that Russian troops uh, will be withdrawn from Ukraine when the peace uh, settlement is uh, reached. Uh, it was said now many times that uh, uh, Russia uh, uh, does not have any uh, plans for any territories of Ukraine. Uh, of course, Crimea is an integral part of Russia. Uh, and uh, the two Donbas republics are recognized by uh, uh, Russia as uh, independent. Uh, and uh, just to uh, remark that for seven years, that was Russia who was, uh, which was pushing the Minsk II uh, process, not uh, uh, Kiev. And uh, uh, unfortunately, not uh, Paris or uh, Berlin. So uh, uh, I think that from this point of uh, uh, view, uh, there were certain and very significant uh, reasons for, Mo for Moscow to uh, change its view, to change its stance. But, met but let me repeat myself that the decisions which were taken uh, are very risky and uh, uh, the history will tell if it was a blunder or not. Uh, but these days, from my point of view, what is uh, important is not so much uh, so uh, searching, uh, but, um, in, uh, uh, but a hard work to, uh, uh, to um, introduce the ceasefire as soon as possible uh, to uh, make uh, whatever is uh, necessary and uh, possible to support uh, the context, uh, the talks uh, which have started between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. I know many people uh, uh, in many uh, countries which uh, in fact uh, do, do not want these talks to uh, succeed. Um, but uh, hopefully the uh, majority of those in the political circles and in diplomatic uh, uh, service, uh, most of them uh, want a, a success in putting all the hostilities to, uh, uh, to the end. So uh, I belong to those uh, who are working very hard and Daryl uh, knows that um, to, uh, you know, uh, on second tracks to uh, promote this uh, urgency of stopping uh, the uh, hostilities, of stopping uh, the fighting, and as soon as uh, possible to uh, proceed with peaceful solution. So I'm, I'm noting here that uh, Daryl has put in the chat a uh, link to a resource on the Budapest uh, memorandum. Um, and uh, I'm trying to keep track of, of what we've got here. We've got you know, a mere 45 questions and about uh, seven minutes to go. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, is there one question here from Tim Takaro. Um, can we, excuse me on the pronunciation of your last name. 
Uh, where can we find corroboration of Alexei's statement that yesterday the Kremlin recognized the sovereignty of Ukraine and its current president? Alexei, can you tell us where we can find that? And uh, let's try and keep our, our answer short so there's time for some more. Well, uh, if I go to try it, uh, uh, there, is a there is a constant question, does or does not uh, Russia or the, or the Kremlin or the public uh, opinion uh, recognize a sovereignty of uh, Ukraine? Uh, uh, of course, they do. And uh, nobody for many years uh, put uh, into doubt the uh, legitimacy of, uh, of the Ukrainian uh, state. Uh, we, we had, uh, you know, a, a huge trade and economic uh, cooperation, uh, 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 a lot, including in the uh, uh, military sphere. Uh, and by the way, uh, in the uh, declaration of the state uh, um, sovereignty, uh, of 90, uh, uh, 90, the sovereignty of Ukraine, uh, the uh, point of neutrality was uh, embedded. Uh, but uh, just to say that uh, from my point of view, uh, nobody seriously in Russia put uh, under question uh, uh, sovereign uh, right of the Ukrainian uh, uh, state to uh, exist uh, and to develop like uh, like uh, they want, but uh, uh, what uh, uh, Russia is driven in this uh, situation that uh, there is uh, only one uh, condition which Russia wants to be observed. And this uh, condition uh, is to have Ukraine uh, in military terms uh, as a neutral country and not a member of a military bloc which uh, in all of its strategic uh, documents and uh, doctrines uh, depicts Russia as its uh, uh, main uh, threat. Thank you for that. Um, you, know, you know, the conversation is sobering and helps us to understand uh, how much there is to uh, overcome uh, if we were to um, uh, come to a, a, a negotiated resolution of the of the multiple levels of conflict. Uh, Claire Schaefer, we, we don't have much time, uh, and Claire Schaefer Duffy has asked what I think is maybe the most important question for us as we close, uh, which is, what role can civil society play in urging a ceasefire? How can we aid track to diplomacy? Uh, and um, uh, maybe to start with, uh, with Talia, maybe go to Talia, Daryl, and then uh, Alexei in, in, in answering. Well, I think, first of all, the civil society has the task to, to uh, counter militarization and, and to introduce other concepts such as common security and, and say what they mean so that we don't uh, come into this military uh, arms race where where we know where we end up and so that's i think the main position also in in the countries now <clears throat> one can demonstrate against war this is an important task in all countries we can demonstrate against for example in finland of becoming a member of nato or, or for becoming a member of nato however you want to put it. And <clears throat> I think there we can see now that there is in civil society, there's a lot of discussions going on. And I think this is a very good thing in, in sort of creating a platform for citizens to take a standpoint in every country. Thank you. Daryl? Well, it's a great question. Um, look, I think quite simply, uh, you know, we need to recognize the situation is urgent. Uh, people are dying now. Um, the, the conflict could grow much worse in the hours and days ahead. So we need to raise our voices anywhere and, and everywhere uh, for an immediate end to the fighting and unconditional uh, ceasefire and withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukraine uh, with a call for uh, talks to resolve the remaining issues uh, through diplomacy. And 
I think here in the United States and, and in Europe and around the world, um, we need to make that, that uh, clear. Um, we also need to lift up the voices of those in Russia who are trying to say the same thing, but who are uh, getting censored. Um, that would be my, my message for the immediate term. Um, and uh, there's much more that needs to be done over the longer term uh, as I discussed, but the immediate concern is to, to end the, the, uh, the fighting and, and the possibility of, of further, further death and destruction. Well, actually, with the exception of uh, yours truly, you get the last word. Uh, well, uh, last year in uh, October, I went to Barcelona and I was privileged to take part in the Barcelona Peace uh, con uh, Congress. Uh, and before I uh, came there, I was very skeptical uh, on the issue of uh, the contemporary um, um, uh, anti-war movement, uh, uh, especially in uh, Europe. I was under the impression that it was almost non-existent. But in Barcelona, uh, I saw dozens and hundreds of uh, associations and um, uh, campaigns and uh, movements uh, which are quite strong and which are, are eager to, uh, to raise their uh, uh, voice against uh, militarization and uh, non-proliferation uh, uh, and uh, the uh, banishing of, of nuclear weapons altogether. So uh, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, in the coming years, the uh, anti-war uh, movement in uh, Europe will get uh, stronger uh, because, uh, unfortunately, um, there is quite uh, quite um, a significant chance that now we are entering uh, into quite a long period of uh, hostilities, of uh, animosity which may uh, last for years, uh, but uh, which uh, also may last for uh, decades. For, uh, so uh, from my point of view, for example, the uh, initiative uh, of uh, the Common Security uh, Commission based on the, principles, on the principles of the Olaf Palme Commission report, which was released back in uh, 1982, are of uh, uh, extreme uh, uh, importance. So in uh, uh, Russia, there are uh, hundreds uh, of uh, uh, hundreds of scientists which still are uh, involved in Pagosh uh, movement, in, uh, in, in other projects, uh, in many second tracks uh, activities. Uh, the goal of uh, uh, which uh, is to uh, prevent further uh, conflicts uh, and to rebuild uh, trust. So um, let's hope the, that uh, this kind of uh, aspirations will uh, prevail. Thank you, Alexei. I'm going to use the, uh, the prerogative of the chair here to say a couple of, of things. Uh, first of all, I've just put into the uh, chat uh, the contact information uh, for um, initiative, an international initiative uh, for this Sunday, uh, calling for demonstrations around the world, uh, urging an, an end to the war, uh, withdrawal and diplomacy. Uh, so please, uh, you can find a demonstration near you uh, there. Uh, following what, what uh, Alexei was just saying, uh, this April, um, a new common security report will be issued. Uh, it's a collaboration of the Olaf Palma Foundation um, uh, International Peace Bureau uh, and the International Trade Union Confederation, which has something like 200 million members worldwide. Um, uh, it's, I think it's important, uh, especially as we move into this uh, very challenging period, uh, and simply to say that um, my organization, the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, uh, will be organizing uh, a, a webinar and other, other events to help uh, promote that and bring that uh, to, to, to people's attention. Finally, I just want to say that in some ways, this has not been an easy uh, webinar. Uh, uh, the differences are quite deep. Uh, the killing is uh, going on. 
uh, and, I, and, and Alexei was simply just now pointing uh, to the dangers of what some have described as a possible ice age uh, beyond a Cold War coming. So I want to um, uh, encourage and the value of keeping lines of communication open uh, despite our differences uh, and to encourage uh, all of us in civil society to do all that we can uh, to work for, uh, for peace, uh, for justice, uh, and uh, to, to stanch climate change, uh, which is uh, coming at us uh, uh, minute by minute. Thank you all so much for the thought you uh, gave in, in, uh, in your presentations. Uh, and uh, we look forward to working together with you and to everyone else who, who joined today's uh, webinar. Thank you so much and peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. All the best, take care. Same.